Welcome to the Media Chwits number 155. I'm Mark Glazer, executive editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we'll be talking about cutting the cord to cable and how popular that's becoming now with the rise of new streaming services, both standalone networks offering streaming, such as HBO, and also the new skinny bundles from places like Sony, Apple TV is working on it, Verizon is. What does this mean for cable and satellite pay TV bundles? Could this be the coming of the great unbundling? Before we get into that, a word from our sponsor. Running your own business requires focus, and so does parenting. Media Twit's podcast sponsor, NextSpace, created a place where parents could give their best quality of attention to both. Co-working space and childcare space under one roof. Learn more at nextspace.us slash nextkids. Indeed, I am at Nextspace here, um, and my son Everett goes to Next Kids next door. Also, Media Shift has just launched a new series of online trainings called Digital Ed in partnership with top journalism schools. Our first two courses are on Mobile Journalism and Measuring Impact, Real-World Media Training for the Digital Age. Sign up at digitaledcourse.com. So before we get into our discussion on the podcast today, I want to introduce our panel. We have Eric Elia joining us from Kane Cade, Jerry Smith from Bloomberg News, Kathy Gill from the University of Washington, and our producer, Jefferson Yen, in Los Angeles with his Dodgers hat on. So um, we have a real, I mean, this is a real shift. We've been covering cord cutting for quite some time, a media shift. It's been a lot of people just get tired of paying these, these cable bills that have just gone up, up, and up, and satellite as well. Um, and now, you know, we've, we've talked about it for the longest time, and now it feels like something has changed, something has really shifted. In the past five years, 3.8 million um, households now don't have now don't have satellite or cable TV, and 20% of millennials have dropped TV watching over the past few years. Um, so it really feels like this is you know this is that moment. Um, Eric, I know you've been we've been talking about this for some time. Do you feel like this is really this is the year because of all these new services that are coming out? Yeah, you know, my last company, uh, we started it in 2005, and we believed that um, the what happened to music, news, other media was going to happen to television and movies and video, and it was going to be a seven to ten year journey, and we're, we're at that ten year mark right now. The technology's uh, been set and in place to do this for the past few years, but only now are you seeing the deals come into place and content owners start to bring their services out. Um, a little bit more, with a little bit more prom promiscuousness, I would say, uh, than they have before. And I think that the watershed uh, is really HBO Now. And this is a timely podcast with, with that launching this week and the, the new Game of Thrones uh, season launching at the same time. That's probably the first premium service that would compel people um, to 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 really be able to make make some shifts, um, and I think it'll open some interesting opportunities up on on the high end. I have some some other thoughts as well, but um, I think by the end of this year, we will see maybe ten different new distributors aggregators offering subscription TV services, and we'll probably see more than more than that in terms of direct subscription networks going out like HBO on their own. Um, so while the cost, the opportunity to bring your cost may be coming down, um, there's going to be a lot more choice and a lot more confusion for consumers for a while. Yeah, it is confusing. And what about sports? This has always been the one thing, you know, that's been so difficult. You know, the sports, yeah. a lot of the leagues offer kind of streaming packages where you get to see all the games except the own one, <laughs> your local sports team. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's so are they... Are they going to crack, or those are long-term deals that are going to be hard yeah, to break those are, up? Yeah, those are long-term deals, and it's funny. It's easy to vilify the, um, the the cable or satellite companies or what in the industry they call that, the MVPDs, but, um, you know, a lot of the prices that have increased with, with cable and, and satellite TV is related to the sports rights. Those sports rights are related to a lot of the contracts that exist, um, and, and so... 
you know, you, you may blame your cable company, but you, you might also look at, at the all-star your, your hometown team just re-signed for a ludicrous contract. Um, you know, it's interesting. The NFL has had a full subscription package available overseas and to U.S. military abroad uh, for, for several years. And uh, the technology's there, the capabilities there, but it's, it's all about the rights. And while it's more lucrative to distribute through traditional means, you won't see this, this changing for some time, and that'll, that'll keep people locked into whatever services they have. Um, I, I think ML, the NBA, MLB, um, NHL certainly can be and have been a little bit more um, aggressive, and the, the NFL will be the, the last one to, to, to come out with any sort of digital product. I think they announced they're streaming one game next season has been the, the announcement. What I'm waiting for... And, I, and I'll pause after this. I'll, I'm waiting for someone with a lot of cash, Apple, Amazon, Google, to really go after it with football and make it worthwhile financially. And I think that will be the huge change. When we saw it with football when Fox Network started, we saw it when DirecTV launched. And in America, the NFL has the potential to be a kingmaker with the TV service. And we'll see if someone, someone will... Um, We'll be able to step in over the next few years and 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 get in there. Yeah, good point. And Jerry, tell us about um, you know with all these kind of skinny bundles that you know you've been covering a little bit. We got Sony has a View service. It's through PlayStation. You have to have a PlayStation box. Um, you know, Apple is working on something. Dish already has Sling TV. That's that's already out there. Verizon's working on one, and basically, it's a, kind of a smaller package of of live TV. Tell us about what you think about kind of how you would compare and contrast these skinny bundles, and which ones you think might have an edge. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, just we were just talking about sports, and I think that Dish Sling TV is a really interesting new offer because it comes with ESPN. Um, you know, sports has always sort of kept the bundle together. A lot of people have said, you know, I don't want to drop my cable TV package because I still want ESPN. And now Dish has this little TV service where you can get ESPN and about 20 other channels for $20. Um, so Sling TV is really interesting. They haven't officially said how many people have subscribed, so we don't really know yet just how popular it's been. Um, I mean, one thing that's interesting about Sling TV is... Uh, some of the contracts between um, DISH and the, the TV networks, they actually come with um, subscriber limits where the um, Sling TV can't reach, I think the number is about 2 million subscribers. And once it reaches that threshold, um, you know, the networks could potentially be, be able to pull their channels from Sling TV. And, and I think that's really interesting because it shows how there's a certain amount of caution um, from the TV networks about this whole... Um, you know, a la carte world, this whole skinny bundle world. Um, you know, the, the TV networks have had a very lucrative relationship with uh, the Comcast of the world for a very long time, and they are very hesitant to dive headfirst into this, uh, this new streaming TV world uh, because there's a lot of concern that they could jeopardize this, um, you know, the 500-channel the bundle that they make a lot of money off because you look... Look at a, um, a network like Viacom, for example. They have a whole lot of channels. Some of them are popular, but a lot of them are not as popular. And they've always, their model has always been, you know, they go to Comcast and say, you need to buy all of our channels, even the ones that aren't getting as much uh, traction. So now you've got these skinny bundles like Sling TV where you can only get 20 channels for $20. And that really puts... Um, you know, that's a real challenge and, and a potential threat to some of these big TV networks. So Sling TV, I think, is going to be really interesting to watch, see how popular it gets over time. Um, you know, Sony has this new service that I think is actually pretty much recreating the traditional TV bundle in a lot of ways. There's a lot more channels. Uh, it's a lot more, it's, it's more expensive. Um, certainly what Apple is planning is going to have a lot of interest because Apple, over time, it... Uh, tries to disrupt an industry, it, it, it succeeds pretty um, amazingly so. So, you know, Apple is talk, uh, reportedly talking to several TV networks, um, you know, and Verizon is also looking to do something uh, that seems to be more focused on getting television on your mobile phone. Um, so, you know, I do think we're going to see more and more of these, uh, these sort of skinny bundles. I mean, 
people what they ultimately want, as you know, is they want to want you know they just want to watch they just want to pay for the TV shows they want. They don't want to pay for you know eighty five hundred dollars a month for this big bloated five hundred channel bundle. And now they have more options than ever to do that. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, what do you what do you think about Verizon and like you know the the cell companies actually having a service that's obviously running on cell phones and maybe tablets and things like that. I mean, they they obviously have a lot of customers, so they could sell to them, but, you know, they're also, like the cable companies, people don't necessarily like their cell companies that much either. Yeah, I mean, I don't know all the details about Verizon service, but, I mean, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is uh, the data caps that you have on your phone. I know that I have a plan with AT&T where if I watch a lot of video on there, um, you know, I, I reach my um, my cap, and if I go yeah. over that cap, I have to pay more. So um, certainly, if you're watching a lot, you know a 30-minute TV show on your phone, and you're not connected to Wi-Fi, but you're connected to a cell network, um, you're going to eat through that data plan pretty fast. Yeah, good point. And Kathy, you wrote, you know, we have a special all this week on MediaShift just about cord cutting and all the streaming options, and you did a comparison of these kind of streaming TV sticks, Chromecast, I think was the first one, and now Amazon has one, and Roku's come out with one, and you you really like the Amazon stick. Um, what what was it about that, that that made you like that? What what was what was good about it? Well, the, the, the first reason I was looking for the Amazon stick is because I have an Apple TV. I am an Apple house. So in order to watch um, Amazon Prime, I, you know, I, I had hacks to do that. So I was really excited to say, okay, let's, let's see what that looks like. But at the same time, everybody was pushing Chromecast and talking about how wonderful it was. So it was on sale. I bought them both. Um, and what I found in my experience, which apparently is a minority experience, Chromecast was a disaster. It, it was a disaster in terms of getting it set up, user interface not working, and then Amazon was like Apple. It worked out of the box, both on our television, nice big 65-inch thing, but on our in-laws' um, persnickety Sony. And, you know, it's Sony. It's persnickety. Everything is proprietary with Sony. And... Um, their Netflix interface from the smart television uh, was painful. Painful is being kind. So we're now, they're now using the Fire Stick um, just to watch Netflix on their Sony, right? I mean, well, not just because they watch some Amazon Prime too, but, but primarily because the interface on the Sony was so bad. Yeah, and so what, I mean, obviously they're a lot cheaper to get. Um, the interface probably depends on each of them. I mean, how do they compare these kind of sticks to the kind of bigger boxes? Um, the processing power and memory and all of that is uh, slimmed down on the sticks, and the sticks are all wireless. So if you don't have a good Wi-Fi connection, you're going to see stutter. And... Um, it's worse you're going to see stutter sometimes anyway because I swear the providers throttle you when they say they aren't throttling you. Um, but that, I mean, that's one of the really big differences is can I, do I want a wired connection or, do I, or can I live with a wireless connection? Um, the dongles are nice too for travel, so you take them with you. One of my friends, when I sent a little note out saying, okay, I'm going to be talking about cord cutting, tell me your experiences. Um, takes the Apple TV and the and the Chromecast every time they travel, and they use them in their hotel rooms. That's kind of cool. It's certainly a use I had not thought of for them. And um, yeah, but, but again, you've got to have a really good Wi-Fi connection in your hotel. Now, one of the cool things about the Amazon Fire Amazon Fire TV Stick that's really poorly named. Um, is that Amazon just announced that they uh, will now be able to log into um, Wi-Fi networks that require you to go through the, the web browser hoop. You guys know what I'm talking about. Right. You don't just, like connect, but you have to go through that authentication thing. And they're the first one to do that. So that's going to be big for dorm rooms and campus, um, you know, campus Wi-Fi, as well as anybody who wants to use it for traveling. Yeah. 
And Eric, you talked about when the Chromecast came out, you wrote something for us. You thought that was going to really change things. And now do you see that happening with it, with these sticks just being so convenient that you can carry them? I mean, they're that tiny and you can get streaming on them? Yeah, it really, it really did change things. And I think Chromecast, you know, maybe not. It, it'll almost be like Google, Google Glass looking back. Like <laughs> that product in and of itself may not be the one people are using five years from now. But it, it really did change things and was very influential. What Chromecast essentially did was say, if it can run in your browser and run on your computer, it can run on the TV because it's just mirroring to another screen. And I think that opened the door to some of the distribution we're seeing through these other, other devices. Um, the sticks are really mini streaming computers, and, and they've just gotten really small. And... Um, you know, I think I think the, from an ergonomic standpoint, they're different than the boxes, but they're really kind of the same product. They're all different. They're, they're more, you know, Apple TV, Roku, Roku Stick, Fire TV, Fire TV Stick have more in common with each other than they do with Chromecast, which is really just the mirroring device. Android TV that's coming out um, has more in common with, with those other devices, and these have a combination of aggregated services and apps where you can either subscribe to a service on there or pay for different things a la carte or install third-party products. Um, and that's, that's where things get really interesting this year where you're going to potentially need multiple boxes if you want to access multiple services, like Kathy commented. If you want to watch Transparent and you have an Apple TV, you also need to have an Amazon-enabled device. So that could be a Fire TV or it could be a, um, or it could be a Roku. Um, yeah. but, or you uh, can, or you can like iPad AirPlay it, like like we do. So I mean, yeah, yeah this I is mean, not this is not the simple experience that we all want. No, you know, no we it's want not. Not to plug and, and so, play. So the rumor is Apple is going to announce a a new Apple TV uh, in in June. Uh, the rumor is that it'll there will be some sort of subscription product that they're 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 going to bring to market, and I would expect they're going to open the App Store up. Uh, for for TV apps, and so what that would mean is uh, the Apple TV then becomes an interesting product where you've got the high end, um, you've got the HBO Now, um, you've got a subscription product, probably look kind of like Sling TV or better, you would think, and then on the 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 lower end or longer tail, you've got any app that you can install, almost like Roku, which is what made what's made Roku so great. Um, and then you can start to put together your own package. It'll probably cost more than a cable subscription, but, but you get uh, choice and control and and less ads and and the things that you want to pay for um, that that you want with that sort of experience you'll be able to pay for. Um, it's certainly going to be a lot more capability for consumers this year, but it, it may not cost less. Yeah, and and Jerry, what do you think about that with Apple's kind of new service and and what what could the cable companies do to kind of strike back in a way? Um, we know that Comcast has been thinking about this, and I mean they could just go the Apple way and say, okay, everything's all a cart now. You know, we'll we'll let you buy whatever channel you want. I mean, obviously they have contracts with a lot of these providers, but um, what what are cable's options now as things break apart? Yeah, I mean, like you said, the, the cable operators like Comcast are actually hamstrung by the contracts they have with the TV networks. Um, you know, like pretty much most cable operators also offer skinny bundles where you can, you know, for, I think Comcast, for example, has uh, 40 bucks a month and you can get, um, you know, a dozen or so channels and internet and HBO, uh, but they don't market it very aggressively. Um, and they actually have limits in the contracts about how many of these um, skinny bundles that they can sell. And the reason is that if you're a TV network, um, you want your channel to be in the highest tier bundle because then you're getting the most eyeballs on your shows and then you can obviously charge the most for advertising. So uh, the cable companies, they recognize that people are willing to pay less, get fewer channels but they're actually um, limited as to how many of these skinny bundles, because they, they offer something very similar to what Sling TV is offering. They just, there's some limitations about how aggressively they can market it and how many people they can actually sell it to. But another yeah. thing I just wanted to, to mention, I mean, I thought Kathy made some really interesting points. I mean, one, she was talking about uh, stuttering uh, of, of shows, and I think that is extremely timely 
um, Sling TV over the weekend, uh, there was some issues where um, some subscribers weren't able to watch uh, the first Final Four game because they had errors. And uh, Sling TV apologized and said basically they had too many people signing up at the same time. Um, and this isn't the first time that an online streaming service is essentially had crashed. Um, I mean, HBO Go had this issue last year with the Game of Thrones. Uh, I think it was the, either the season finale or the premiere. Um, ESPN, their streaming app, had some issues last year during the World Cup. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be really interesting on Sunday when the Game of Thrones uh, premiere comes out and you've got this new HBO streaming service about whether there's going to be any problems, whether people are going to encounter uh, you know, buffering or, or crashing, and, and part of that is obviously the speed of your internet connection at home, but there's also a lot of work that HBO um, has done. It's really actually a company called MLB that is responsible for doing all of sort of the back-end work for HBO, but um, the reality is, I mean, you know, internet streaming is not as reliable as the old traditional television. Um, and it's just not, you know, the, it doesn't have the the, the infra, it's a fragile infrastructure. If too many people watch something on streaming TV at the same time, there's buffering, there's crashing. Um, and the other point that Kathy made that I thought was really interesting is just you're talking about all these different streaming sticks and all these different boxes, and it is. It, it's kind of, it becomes kind of a headache. Um, when you add it all up, it becomes probably more expensive uh, than cable TV, but it's, there's also a certain amount of convenience to being able to sit back uh, on a couch with your remote and and just be able to get everything in one place um, as opposed to, you know, I have Netflix and I have Sling TV and I have an antenna for my broadcast networks and, um, you know, I think there's some, somebody's going to come forward at some point with a way to bring all this together in a very simple fashion because it's uh, it's inconvenient, and then there's a certain amount of power and control that people like about being able to pick and choose what shows they want to pay for. But uh, it's it's not an easy thing. Yeah, Kathy, did you want to jump in about your experience and just you know the, the pain involved in you know being a cord cutter? Um, well, I can. The pain was Comcast was Chromecast, and I I think the analogy to Google Plus, I mean to well, the analogy to Google Glass. And all of the things that came before, um, spot on. A point though that I that I just thought about is that we we have to go back to early days of cell phones to look at what happens when you go from corded or wired to wireless. And cell phone technology is fairly robust in the sense that it's it's been around a long time. But we still have issues with dropped phone calls. We still have issues with networks being overloaded. So if you contextualize cutting the cord, i.e. your cable line, in the same way, we're like back in the 60s or something in terms of like where cell phones were, or maybe the 70s. So it's a it's a it's a big deal. And I I think the people who are going to be last to leave traditional television distribution or the sports folks because for all the reasons that the guys mentioned the sports people particularly football they are not going to give up that gravy train easily and so if you are a die-hard sports person you're going to probably stick with your television you may add something so that you can see the show that's at home that you can't see because it's been blacked out um, but, I mean, sports is this teeny, teeny percentage of all television program relative to its cost in your cable package and the number of people who watch it. Yeah, what, what's interesting is non-sports fans have essentially subsidized sports for, for years for the, for the, uh, for the sports fans. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. And, you, you know, for a casual fan that might watch a game or two a month or something like that, you know, would you, would you pay $15 a month or would you just pay for the games you would want? It's uh, a lot of interesting questions. For sure. Well, thanks a lot. It's been a really great discussion. I want to thank our panel of guests, Eric Alaya from Kincaid, Jerry Smith from Bloomberg News, Kathy Gill from University of Washington, and our producer, Jefferson Yan. I want to thank our sponsor, Next Space, 
and Next Kids. You can learn more about their program at nextspace.us slash nextkids. You can catch us each and every Friday at the Media Schwitz at PBS Media Shift at pbs.org slash media shift. Thanks, everyone.